Welcome everyone to the North Texas Church of Free Thoughts weekly service event. It's March 21st, 2021. Now we do run these live every week and we have a presentation probably most of the time, but not every single time. But if you want to participate in the live uh, discussion, uh, see the presentation as it happens and then discussion afterwards, which we don't put on YouTube, the discussion, then please go to our website, www.churchoffreethought.org. That web uh, address will come up later. And uh, sign up at the bottom of any page with your email address, and the, that way you'll get the weekly notices. And, of course, uh, click the PayPal button as well and uh, give us some of your money. You don't need that stuff. God doesn't need it. He's got all the money in the, in, uh, the universe. At any rate, uh, we talked last time about uh, this interesting subject, the surprising way in which an invention – the cotton gin, um, more easily and efficiently separated cotton seeds from cotton fiber, but it contributed to the rise of the peculiar color-coded system of slavery and its devastating aftermath in the USA, which we're still living with. At one point was mentioned the Cornerstone Address. This was delivered by the Confederate States of America Vice President Alexander H. Stevens on March 21st, 1861. Isn't that interesting? Just 160 years ago this very day in Savannah, Georgia. In that address, which was the Confederate version, uh, not so much of, of the Gettysburg Address in terms of it being a memorial or on a battlefield, but he gave an explanation of what the Confederate States of America were all about, just as Lincoln referred to the founding ideals of the United States of the Union. Stevens asserted that the basis of the southern states' uh, secession and the government that they formed was surprisingly not states' rights at all. But, well, here's how he put it. I'll just let you read that. Let it sink in. In less than 85 years since the Declaration of Independence, it became widely believed, especially where slavery was thought to be indispensable to the southern state's cotton production, that the Negro, as if he or anyone else, this Stevens guy, as if he or anyone else then or since knows specifically what that is, as if that person, those people, were not even human or not completely so, and they really believed that, that they were subhuman in some significant way. This belief can charitably be called biblical anthropology, because remember, at one time, people drew all their science from the Bible, and Christian doctrines, and this had only begun to change with Copernicus and Galileo. But anthropology, just like astronomy, came out of the Bible until the reformers, and especially Darwin of the 19th century. But even worse, that kind of biblical archaeology that put the Negro beneath the white man, not only were there different races, but there was a hierarchy of races created by God. The leading scientists of the 19th century supported that. Today we know better. Or we should know better, though it seems most people don't. And this is why the term racism ought to be in quotes. Because the concept of race, as it has come to be understood by most people in America, even now in the 21st century, I'm not sure about people elsewhere in the world, but certainly in the United States, that notion is biologically, which is to say scientifically, which is to say objectively invalid. It is not rooted in the reality that we can all see, hear, taste, touch, or build machines to detect for us. And in particular, it has no genetic basis. This was proved by the Human Genome Project that was completed in April of 2003 and announced at the time that there are no genes for race, no genetic basis for it. Well, here's some people who have not heard about social distancing. There is, of course, variation among human beings, just as there is for other species, but this variation falls far short, far short, of established scientific criteria for what qualifies for subdivisions of race or subspecies in uh, mammals of our size. There's disagreement and controversy on this point when it comes to some other species, but not for humans, because the facts don't support it. So race is a cultural construct. It is an invention of human beings. Race is a fantasy. And like all fantasies, it tells us more about ourselves than about anything else. In fact, the idea of race is very like the idea of ghosts, fairies, dragons, leprechauns, and yes, gods. By the way, I looked uh, online for a, a group picture of fictional beings, mythical creatures, or imaginary characters, but 
I had to make a collage because for some unfathomable reason, none of those ensemble images included deities. In fact, there are many similarities between the idea of race and these other notions. For one, each one of them are so ambiguous as to be nearly meaningless. What exactly qualifies as a dragon or a fairy or a god? Well, it depends what story you read, I suppose, just like the gods depend on what church or temple you walk into. Gods in particular come in a wide variety of forms and each one of them is conceived of in countless ways. They can be very anthropomorphic or completely indescribable if not inconceivable. And of course, Spinoza's God, how do you picture that? The panentheism, that God is just imminent in the universe as they say. And we can't possibly put a picture of Allah up here because uh, that, that's against their religion. So you just have some Arabic uh, symbols for that. I suppose an imaginary being is best described that way anyways. These deities can have any number of attributes. Most are perfect, but of course, never perfectly evil, perfectly ignorant, or perfectly negligent, though all are, as we know, perfectly ridiculous. For as we know very well, as soon as one begins to closely scrutinize the idea, it falls apart. And this is why theological dogmas and supernatural claims generally must not be questioned or probed. You see, they're fragile things. These are the same problems with race that there are with God. Revealingly, in both cases, so many people are just obstinately certain that they know just what it is, that they can become very upset and may even assault you or kill you if you so much as express doubt about it. Yet no one can say just what race is. It is supposed to be a fundamental and intrinsic property of every human being as much as blood type, height, weight, and other attributes that we can actually define and measure. And we can measure skin reflectance or absorption at visible wavelengths. So is it just all about skin color? No. How about the absorption at wavelengths at which melanin absorbs? Well, it turns out there are different kinds of melanin, interestingly enough. Hair form varies as well, as do all biometric measures from person to person. We've already noted that the Human Genome Project failed to find a genetic basis for race. At least one United Nations document basically says that race amounts to quote unquote ethnicity. But what is that? How is that to be measured? There are many differences between people of different and even the same nations all over the world. The Hutus and the Tutsis of Rwanda come to mind. And is there such a thing as Koreans when there are both North Koreans and South Koreans? Should we distinguish or lump together New Englanders, Southern Californians, Idahoans, Floridians, and Texans? Perhaps what is important is how people are perceived by others, no matter how they regard themselves. Which others? I know of children of Korean, European, well, Korean and European parents, mom and dad, and those kids look Asian to most Americans, but those same kids look Anglo to Koreans. Or should one's own self-identification be the deciding factor? You can just decide what race you are, really? Well, the US Census Bureau, operating on the basis of the Office of Management and Budget Standards of 1997, does use self-identification. You just decide what you are. In principle, identical twins could be of different races because they feel differently about themselves. Is there really a problem with that in as much as there is no genetic basis for race? I mean, what the heck? As for what the Census Bureau is actually measuring, it admits it has no idea. How many races are there then? There's no clear answer on that one either. Race theorists of the 19th century held that there were three, Caucasoid, Negroid, and Mongoloid, with many subtypes of each. One theorist claimed to have identified upwards of 60 human races and subraces, 20 or so alone in Europe. Some say there are four races, white, black, Asian, and Austro Australoid. If you look it up on the internet, we'll say that, at least one source. Now, interestingly, in 1775, just the year before the Declaration of Independence, the German physician and anthropologist, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who's really a bright guy if you read up on him, he suggested in his treatise, The Natural Varieties of Mankind, that there were five broad varieties of humanity, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Ethiopian, which became Negroid, American Indian, and Malayan. The U.S. Census Bureau, which again is the OMB's 1997 standard, not something just made up, 
They today use five that are similar to Blumenbox, white, black, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, although it also allows people to say that they are, quote, some other race, unquote, without specifying it. So is some other race a race, I wonder? I noticed in connection with the recent shootings at massage parlors in Atlanta that news reports have referred to quote, the AAPI community, uh, by which AAPI means Asian American Pacific Islanders. So I've really had to wonder whether people of Samoan, Filipino, Vietnamese, and Japanese ancestry all think of themselves as being in the same community, or might they have grounds to resent being lumped together by those to whom they, quote, all look alike. The Census Bureau allows people to choose more than one race. What does that mean? Can one be more than one race? That would be a very strange way to categorize people. Certainly people cannot be more than one age or weight or gender preference, can they? Or is every possible combination of race its own race? So much for what is assumed by all to be a clear, distinct, and intrinsic personal attribute called quote unquote race. As I said, it resembles nothing so much as the sort of absurdity that one finds in theology. Now, Blumenbach, who I mentioned earlier, there he is at the top, uh, turns out he did not consider the varieties of humanity that he dis distinguished to mean what modern believers in race now claim. In another of his books, a groundbreaking work entitled On the Unity of Mankind, which is still recognized as being very good, valid science, Blumenbach asserted that all of humanity is one race. And you see the quotation there because one variety of mankind does so sensibly pass into the other that you can't mark out the limits between them. In the 20th century, so hundreds, uh, 150 or so years later, the idea of clines, C-L-I-N-E-S, clines, meaning gradients or slopes, came into use. And you see that quote from Ashley Montague, an anthropologist who shortly uh, after, uh, well, around the time of World War II, pointed out, there are no races, only clines. Darwin famously drew attention to dog breeding as being in some respects similar to the process of natural selection, but don't suppose that the alleged races of people are remotely like the breeds of dogs. Here's an article that goes into quite a lot of technical detail in debunking that claim. So if you come across that, you can just pause on the YouTube video and uh, go and put in that URL. And here is a wonderful source of further reading about how we in our society got to where we are today to this terrible situation with respect to this thoroughly discredited idea of race being so widely and deeply rooted in the minds of people of all quote unquote races. I did find the entire text of this book online at one time, but that link no longer works. But this is highly recommended. If you don't read anything else, this is a really good work, uh, place to start. I mentioned this resource last time. If you're more into watching videos, I believe most of them are on YouTube also. Very excellent, I do recommend it. And you can read text and transcripts online. So here's this question we began with. Clearly, Alexander H. Stevens and the Confederate States of America, of which he was vice president, as well as the whole barbarous system of slavery on which it was built, and the public policies in the states and in the federal government then and for a long time after the end of the Civil War were very, very racist. But today, knowing what we now know, even though just as clearly many people still don't know it, the question itself is ambiguous. We can ask the question in a variety of ways, each of which comes with its own difficulties. Well, that's what makes it interesting as well as important. But let's just take the last one for today. How do Americans compare to others when it comes to racism? And we'll have a go at this, even though we can't really define racism. There is something called the World Values Survey. This is a global project of cooperating social scientists from 120 countries around the world that since 1981 has conducted surveys assessing people's values. You see their website there on screen and an example, of, this is an example of their findings. It has nothing to do with race. This shows how people in various countries rank the importance of family, work, friends, leisure time, religion, and politics. Think about how you would rank those things in your life. We see the USA there at about 2.30. If you think of it like a clock face, there are 2.30. We're in there with Russia, Ukraine, Singapore, and Spain. 
And most other countries are like the U.S. in putting family first. But now look over on the left-hand side at Egypt, Algeria, and Qatar. Their religion is considered the most important. And now look at how the people of most countries put politics last, the little blue dots in the center, including here in the USA. Politics doesn't make it into the top three anywhere that they did the survey. In China, South Korea, the Netherlands, Australia, Estonia, Germany, Hong Kong, Japan, New Zealand, and Sweden, people rank religion last. Of course, you have another bugaboo there because what is religion? We've talked about that before. Doubtless we'll revisit it again, but for this, for now, it's just what people each individually said it was. In the USA, the importance of religion is next to last with politics being last. Would you have guessed that from what you see in the news? So go to this website, it's full of all kinds of interesting things and it's almost a way to get to know your fellow humans all over the planet a little bit better. Uh, obviously it's boiled down information and the devil is in the details, not every person in every country is going to give these responses, but it's interesting nonetheless. So here's what the World Value Survey found when they asked people who they would not want to have for neighbors. You see the percentage boxes over there on the left the darkest blue being the lowest, uh, 0 to 4.9%, and then on up to uh, more than 40% in the red. It shows the percentage that chose, and they gave them a list, people of another race. That was a choice for who you would not want to have for neighbors. We don't know just what people of another race meant to those respondents, and you understand why based on the earlier discussion. It, Maybe the only thing being measured is people's propensity to lie so as to be thought better of. On the other hand, people that hate are often not ashamed of it. Do you find it surprising that less than 5% of Americans responded in this way, com comparable to Canada, Australia, and most of Western Europe? There's no country that's better, doing better than we are with respect to who you would not want to have for a neighbor. The most racist countries of the world by this measure are the ones in red there, Libya, Turkey, Vietnam, and Myanmar. Now, just because some other country may have more murders than ours should not make us uncaring or complacent about murder. Someone else's families do not diminish our own, and not to comprehend the wrong in something is to go wrong. That is something like Moliere's idea here. But it should give us some satisfaction to know how far we have come from the days of the Confederate States of America. And think of how difficult, how awful it would be if our species did come in races, if there were varieties of human beings with significantly diminished mental and moral faculties. What would our societies and cultures look like if that were the case? We have difficult enough problems with children and the occasional psychopaths as it is. Then again, it may be that our ancestors took care of the problem for us with whatever happened to the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, and other archaic humans. By the way, Moliere here was a playwright, an actor, and a poet. His work often irritated the clergy of his day, and so he doubtless saw what he did as, quote, exercising our philosophy. I think he was talking about himself and his own work. And so, for those who wonder what an atheist church does, our atheist church strives to make sense of, critique, and call for the betterment of the human condition. We're not fearful of making mistakes. We don't say we cannot be questioned, because this is how we learn. We have to learn from our mistakes by being willing to recognize them. We reimagine religion as our supreme value, encountering and explaining what it is like to be ourselves, listening to each other and learning how to live satisfying lives on our shared planet. A couple other things that go along with March 21st, today's date. In 1925, the Butler Act passed. That was the one that prohibited the teaching of evolution in schools. And of course, we all know what happened with that, with the uh, Scopes monkey trial and so forth. In 1965, 40 years later, Martin Luther King was leading 3,200 people or so on the third and, of course, successful march from Selma to Montgomery in the cause of civil rights. And I got that twice, but that's okay. It's very important. On this day in 1932, Nobelist Walter Gilbert was born. Walter Gilbert was a physicist, and he became interested in biochemistry because his wife uh, was working at Harvard with uh, uh, James Watson, the Watson of Watson and Crick, uh, who discovered the structure of DNA, which we recently talked about also. 
Walter Gilbert won the Nobel Prize with a couple of other people for new methods of DNA sequencing. So in a way, we can credit Walter Gilbert with our having the vaccine for the coronavirus now, three vaccines approved in the United States because we were able to get the sequence of that virus so quickly. We had it uh, over a year ago, almost as soon as it was discovered. Also, and here just shows how no God works in mysterious ways. Today, March 21st, is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. How about that? Here are our principles. In lieu of a creed that you must swear to or some kind of statement of faith, we say don't have faith, have doubt, but reason, which is making sense of things, and then joy, which is pursuing happiness. Appreciate, because that is discovering the good, and love, which is your making, meaning, and purpose of your life and in your life, and with others, and help to show others what they have. Don't let politics wreck civility. We're going to be having discussion afterwards online. But remember, it should not, is not, and is not the highest on the scale of importance. Remember, politics is uh, way down the list, right? So think about it that way. And as Voltaire put it in one of the most famous novels of the 18th century, his novel Candide, which if you've never read that, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a book that reads like a comic book. It probably has been turned into a comic book for all I know. But he said, we must cultivate our garden. In other words, devote your energies to your own sphere where you can be effective and not be robbed of your peace of mind by hopes and expectations of things over which you have little or no control. The phrase or the admonition comes up at the end of the book. In one of their last stops in Turkey, Candide, the title character and his companions, are hosted by an old Turkish man who, when asked about some troubles they've heard about in the Ottoman court, he replies, quote, I have no idea what you're talking about. My general view is that people who meddle with politics usually meet a miserable end, and indeed they deserve to. I never bother with what is going on in Constantinople. I only worry about selling the fruits of the garden, which I cultivate, off to be sold there, whereupon they all enjoy a meal containing or including many items from, from that garden. I think uh, it's kind of symbolic. Yeah, you pay your taxes to Caesar, right? So you can't completely ignore it, but... Don't make it the center of your existence. That's for the politicians. And as much as they made it, try to uh, warp our lives to help them, uh, we have our own concerns. Family, friends, work, leisure time, the other things on that world value survey that we saw. As far as uh, principles of civility, there are 15 that we've put up in the past, and these are two. We're just kind of taking them uh, bit by bit. Acknowledge and respect others. Other people have the same desires and concerns that you do. They really do. Chiefly, people learn to be understood, probably even more than being agreed with. I don't care if you agree with me, but I would like to be understood because only in that way are you able to really critique or give me some feedback that uh, I can take to heart. If I think you're just uh, wanting to attack me for the fun of it, the way it happens on the internet and clickbait and so forth, then there's, there's no... Um, learning going on. Unless uh, they prove otherwise, it should be assumed that other people's motives and intentions are good. And uh, this is sometimes called Hanlon's razor. I've seen it called Heinlein's razor, but it goes way back hundreds of years. The idea that you should never attribute to malice or stupidity that which is adequately explained by clumsiness, negligence, or error. Uh, as one other person put it, lethargy and uh, uh, mistaken uh, misconceptions. Remember, as the Bible says, there are some good things in the Bible. One of the things it says is, suffer fools gladly. Once you've done that, of course, you can meet, retire from the field. Keep in mind, too, today and every day, we are embodied minds. Pay attention to your posture, your voice, your physical behavior, because that affects other people more than just, uh, sometimes more than, but certainly as much as the actual words you say. They also influence and are clues to your emotional status. So, important idea. Here's something Lincoln reminded us of. I think it's important. We destroy our enemies when we make them our friends. Don't think about being destructive. Think about being constructive. That's how we make people our friends. People are more likely to be your friend 
when they understand you and when you understand them and, and communicate to them that you believe you understand them. Try to restate their point and steel man it instead of straw man it, as they say. Finally, some things that we probably should have put right up front. Well, I did ask for your money already, but free thought is not free. Go and visit our website at www.churchoffreethought.org. Our church really does depend on your continued support. Thank you for your attendance today and um, those who will come across and see this video later where it's preserved on YouTube. Visit us on Facebook, also sign up on Twitter. It's very low volume on Twitter and not, uh, not oppressive. We're not gonna uh, absorb a lot of your time doing that. But remember, your church depends on your continued support. It's good to give us your money because we do together what none of us can do on our own. And today, uh, and uh, as long as this video is up, there's a special discount. Use code THINKNOW and only tithe 8%. That's a full 20% discount from 10%. Do it today. Help us promote your values. Go ahead and repeat all these ideas. Put them in letters to the editor. Talk about them with your friends. People need to know, for example, that today is the international day to end discrimination. Be the future that you wish to see. Don't sit around and wait for other people. Cultivate your garden. And with that, we'll move on to question and answer discussion. And um, this will go up on YouTube shortly after if it's not up there already. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a good day.